We have a, a guest, a speaker this morning, Ken Johnson. Uh, I met Ken probably about two or three years ago, uh, stumbled into one of his books, and Ken has carved out a niche on Amazon.com that's just unbelievable. Uh, you enter anything about the ancient church fathers, and you get one of Ken Johnson's books pop up very, very quickly. And when I got his first book and began to read it, I realized that this guy is, is really a real scholar who really understands things. And what's really fascinating is most people don't know this, but our ministry's founder, J.R. Church, he read very few books by other people. He read the Bible, and he read the ancient church fathers. And he was just absolutely enamored with some of their writings because it really teaches us the things that were going on in the ancient past and the early church. And Ken has really built, uh, he's a prolific writer. If you go out to his book table and look at all of the books, they have one thing in common. Most of them say ancient on them. Uh, the Book of Jasher, uh, the Book of Jubilees, studies on ancient paganism, the fallen angels, uh, Barnabas, different, different people who have really interesting things to say about the subject of Bible prophecy uh, and the times that we live in today. Now, Ken's latest book is a controversial book in some people's minds. Some people want to take the Book of Enoch and call it inspired canon. And of course, we don't feel that way. And I think we've been very, very clear at Prophecy in the News that we don't view Enoch as canon. But on the other hand, in 2009, J.R. Church and Gary Stearman launched a study that we have available on DVD. Uh, this was in the early days of J.R.'s cancer. And this was the last project that J.R. did before he passed away. They spent almost a year taking the Book of Enoch apart, verse by verse. And J.R. wanted to really know and understand what parts of Enoch could be trusted and what parts of Enoch can't be trusted. And there is a lot of corruption in the book, and we do acknowledge that. But there are parts of Enoch that are just utterly fascinating. I don't want to steal Ken's thunder, but I remember how excited J.R. was telling me about some of the things he read in the book. And he was very clear about it. He said, Bob, Enoch could not have known these things unless he was in either direct communication with God or on an airplane flying over the earth. Because the things that he describes in the book, you can't see by hiking down a trail. You have to be in the air to recognize these things. So for a year in 2009, J.R. and Gary tore the book apart, produced what I think is one of the groundbreaking studies and much to my delight, Ken has produced his own study on the Book of Enoch. And it's a brilliant work. If you don't have it, I know he has very limited copies out there. And you may even have to place an order for it. But with uh, no further ado, I do want to introduce my friend, Ken Johnson. You're going to enjoy him. Thank you. Uh, let's pray and ask the Lord's blessing for our conference and this study. Father, we thank you for the conference. We just ask that you turn our hearts toward the scripture, help us to be serious about what it says, and guide us in all things. We thank you for all your blessings, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, this morning, let me just start off by giving you just a little bit of uh, my background. Uh, I got saved around 12 and went to several different denominations, and as I got older, realized there's a little bit of difference between the denominations. And uh, they may be important and maybe not, but I'm just curious, and I wanted to know what the differences are and what the actual answers are. So having a background in computers, I thought, well, we do this logically like we would anything else. And I'll go back to the source. Well, Jesus is not here currently. The, the apostles have written what they've written. That's what we're kind of confused on in some of their writings in the Bible. So the next source would be anybody that knew the apostles. So we want to look for people that were the disciples of the 12 apostles, people that could say, well, I knew Peter, James, John, I talked to Mary, I interviewed this person and would write stuff down. And there's actually quite a few of that stuff. And that's the ancient church fathers. And I've sought to uh, kind of bring that back. What I found was the teachings on the doctrines that I was curious about were consistent for the first 200 years. Everybody taught the same thing. And if you said something different, you were attacked as a heretic on the spot. Somewhere along the third century, and I, I don't want to speculate how, when, or who, or anything, but just by looking at the writings, it's obvious things got turned around and these new ideas started coming in. 
So I, I wrote several books about the church fathers, and one thing that's interesting that led me to Enoch was the fact that, you know, of course, most of you here know that Jude, the book of Jude in the Bible, quotes out of the first chapter of Enoch. And what we're going to see is the church fathers were very serious about Scripture. We have 66 books in the Bible. They are the inspired Word of God. They are going to be protected. They mean what they say and say what they mean. And for some reason, we're told in, in the Old Testament, there's a history book called the Book of Jasher. It's important if you want to know more information about that. Not necessary at all for anything dealing with salvation, but more information. You can't get a higher recommendation for anything than Scripture. And I thought that was amazing. But Jude also quotes from it, a prophecy nonetheless. And of course, I love prophecies. I've written on prophecies extensively. We've had over 50 prophecies come to pass since Israel's come back. We're going to be talking about that this afternoon and tomorrow. But anyway, the church fathers actually quoted a lot of some of these epistles. The Epistle of Barnabas, uh, the companion of Paul. They talked about Enoch a lot. One of the things I thought was fascinating was Today we have Enoch, usually known as First Enoch, and there's Second Enoch and Third Enoch, Secrets of Enoch, and there's a whole bunch of different things. The Church Fathers basically said there's one book, the one they quoted from, which we know as First Enoch. Uh, the others were put out by cults, and you'll see this a lot. How many of you remember hearing about the Gospel of Judas, Gospel of Mary, those kind of things? They contradict Scripture, so it's really obvious. If you know the New Testament, you pick up this stuff and read it. It either fits or it doesn't. So, but uh, there's things in Enoch, though, that when we compare them, we, we see some things that are definitely Gnostic in flavor, not necessarily heresy, but th things that are out of place, and you get the feeling that certain sections of it are corrupted or been added to, but other sections of it are very, very clear and very amazing. Now, when most people talk about Enoch, the first thing they think of is the story in the first part of Enoch that talks about the fallen angels. Actually, let me back up. The first six chapters refer to the second coming, when the Messiah comes and sets up a, a, a kingdom on earth that does not end, and the time of uh, great trouble that happens right before that. And it's interesting, it's actually addressed in the very first chapter to those people living in that time of tribulation. It actually even uses the word tribulation. Uh, and so when we plug that in with Daniel, Revelation, other things like that, um, it just... Is, is amazing. If I tend to look like or sound like I'm out of breath, this is my first time in Colorado, and <laughs> I'm still kind of adjusting a little bit. I'm doing pretty good, but, you know, slight headaches, slight things like that. Although I have to say my allergies are much better out here, so <laughs> praise God. Um, but so it's a, a desk to that. Chapter 7 through around 20 or so talks about the fallen angels. And that's what everybody gets into. And we've got a lot of information out there by various authors. But people get uh, caught up in that section. And we will talk about that a little bit if we have time. But the other thing is that you get caught up in that and you forget about the prophecies. So let me just look at some of these. And hopefully we're working okay. But looking at the book of Enoch, there are some messianic prophecies. And I thought these were really, really amazing. Now remember, if this is uh, the original book of Enoch, or even if it's been copied or translated or whatever, it's amazing to think that this is, might be a pre-flood document, and yet it's telling us things that are in the Old Testament about the coming Messiah. Uh, just amazing. So for instance here, this is a chart. In the, in the first chapter of uh, my book, I give you the charts of the prophecies and a lot of other things. One of the things that says the Messiah is actually the Son of God. I thought that was interesting. That doesn't seem like a really big deal, but when you witness to Muslims, that is a really, really big deal. There is no Son of God. If you say such a thing, you're damned to hell. That's just all there is to it, according to the Quran. On the other hand, in the Bible, you know, 1 John says, you have to confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Without that, you have no salvation. So that's why you can't be a Christian Muslim. or a Muslim Christian, something like that. The Messiah, whoever or whatever he is, remember at this point when in Enoch, we don't know hardly anything, but there's this person somehow that's going to come and fix things. And he's called the Son of God. We see that in 1 John 5.5 5, and in Enoch 105 verse 2. Uh, just to go on down here, salvation hangs on the Messiah. That's the actual wording. So again, we don't know what that means at this point, but... 
everything hangs on him, whoever he is, this one guy. And he is called a him, not a her. So I thought that was interesting too. Son of God, Messiah. Salvation is by repentance and belief in his name. I thought that was amazing. That's in uh, chapter 50. Also found in Luke 13. Actually all over the scriptures. But Salvation is by believing in the Messiah's name. Salvation is by the righteousness of faith. Now that's something that Paul talked about in Romans. And the concept is really neat. You need to be perfect. You need to be sinless to be in God's kingdom. Okay, but we have this sin nature, this bend. It's almost impossible for us to, well, it is impossible for us to do that on our own. But the concept of the righteousness of faith is, if your attitude is, I am going to be perfect. And if it's not possible, I am going to be as perfect as I can possibly be. If that's your attitude and you could be perfect, you would be perfect. And the fact that you can't quite get there is irrelevant. If that's your attitude, you love God, that's, the, that's salvation, that's the righteousness of faith. And it's just an amazing concept taught in scripture. On the other hand, if you say, I'm a Christian and I did some ritual and now I can do what I want to because I have fire insurance, that's not going to cut it. That's not the righteousness of faith. But, and it goes on, uh, the, the name of the Messiah is hinted at. Now, a lot of people don't realize it, but in Isaiah, it actually says that the Messiah's name would be salvation, the way it's actually mentioned. And if you read it right in Hebrew, it's saying that the Messiah's name will be Yeshua. And this is hinting at it too. It doesn't come right out and say it quite as clear as Isaiah does, but it makes a mention that the Messiah's name would be salvation. Again, Yeshua. Totally different word in Ethiopic, by the way, but thinking that this came from Enoch would be a Hebrew or a Hebrew type language. So it's hinted at. Uh, Messiah is actually called the Word. I thought that was amazing. And the Messiah is called the Son of Man. Because I've often wondered, and, and people talk about we have a quote out of Jude of Enoch. And I don't want to get crazy and say everything points to Enoch. But you have all this stuff through the Old Testament where the Son of Man came. And the word came and said something to somebody. And when Jesus comes here, he says, I am the son of man. I am the word. You know, and that goes back to Jewish ritual, but Jewish ritual may go back even further. And it's interesting to see these kind of things here. So when you have a phrase like that, when it talks about the rapture, it happens out of the midst. That doesn't make any sense. So it's got to be a phrase, something that somebody used back then. Find that out. You find out what you're interested in. So what is the word? What is the son of man? They wouldn't have known, but it was mentioned in here. Now we know the word, the incarnate word. It also says in Enoch 48 that the Son of Man exists with God the Father eternally. I thought that was amazing. There always has been the Son of God, the Messiah, always will be the Son of God. Now, in the New Testament, it's very clearly re uh, mentioned as the doctrine of the Trinity. Not mentioned by name, but taught. And we have it hinted here. Again, it's interesting if this is an ancient Jewish work hinting at uh, the Trinity, much like in Proverbs when it says, do you know what the name of the Son of God is? Tell me if you know. You know, that's a hint that there's a Son of God, that he has a name and apparently existed way back then. So the Son of Man exists with the Father eternally. The Messiah's shed blood is necessary for salvation. This is the first instance that we've noticed that Shed blood is necessary. We've sinned. We're damned for hell, as we should be. It's not necessarily our fault because we were born like this, but that's still not God's fault because we need to be perfect. So this is a problem. And the shed blood of the Messiah, or the Son of God, or the Word, is necessary for salvation. And you can see that there by a few, few Bible references at the side. The Son of Man existed before anything was created. I thought that was interesting. So he's not the Archangel Michael, as some cults teach. He is, again, equal with, the son of, with, with God. He's the Son of God. He's existed with him from eternity, and he's existed before anything that was created was created. We see that in Colossians 1. The Messiah preserves the righteous. We would be lost if it wasn't for him, and he's going to hold us and keep us preserved unto salvation. It's amazing. The Messiah would be a light unto the nations. That's mentioned in Isaiah in several places, and it's ambiguous. It's like he's 
reminding you something from before. So those are a few of the messianic prophecies, and I just thought that was fascinating. Now, there's some people that say that this is all in the Ethiopic version. The version we found among the Dead Sea Scrolls has parts of it, but parts are missing. This messianic part is in the second section, which is not in the Dead Sea Scrolls, supposedly. Uh, it has been rumored that an entire Aramaic version has been found. So we will, shoot, we will soon see. But it's amazing to see these kind of things here. Uh, going on, there's some Bible doctrines that I've noticed in going through the book of Enoch also. No flesh is righteous before the Lord. Again, because of our sin nature. It doesn't say why because of our sin nature, but it's interesting that it says that. also says abortion is murder. I thought that was interesting. The ancient... The ancient book of Enoch will mention the first time abortion came and the surroundings around it. So again, a lot of these ancient texts agree in a lot of things. Uh, the flood covered the entire earth. We're told that in Genesis also. And I think entire means entire, not a certain plane. Uh, Noah and his family spent a year in the ark. Again, you can get that from Genesis too. It rained for 40 days and then it started dissipating. And it took them basically a year before they could actually leave. And then they had to stay on the mountaintops until things were uh, ready. All the pre-flood men and giants perished. I thought that was interesting. That comes in handy later in our study of Nephilim. Um, oh, I skipped a couple. Uh, meditation blinds men to God. Meditation anciently was called sorcery. And of course, we're told that that enters the church in the last days. Again, and the only reason I, I look at these things and mention them to you is because I believe the Bible, much like the church fathers did. It's the inspired word of God. If it says something, and if I don't understand it, that just means I don't understand it, but it means something. And it would be very beneficial to me to figure it out as quickly as I can. Uh, denying the inspiration is like calling God a liar. I thought that was really interesting. So, yeah, and we see this in a lot of other ancient writings too. The Seder Olam mentions that. If you don't think that the Bible, at least the Old Testament from their point of view, is the inspired word of God, God breathed, uh, then that's calling God a liar. So you can't be one with God in this way. Uh, we're told not to alter the writings of the righteous, is what he calls it. We know them today as scripture. Uh, people, in the end, will alter these things create fake Bibles, much like they did in the first century with the uh, Gnostic cults. Ignoring prophecy is a serious sin. I thought that was really interesting. You know, I'm all about prophecy because I want to want to know the future, but, and if you think about it, that makes sense. About a, a, a quarter to a half the Bible's prophecy, you don't want to ignore what God said. It's just as important to know what happened and what he wants you to do now and what's going to happen tomorrow. If he wants you to know, then we should know. But to ignore it and say, who knows what that means, it probably means something else. We just won't mess with it. That's the same thing as ignoring all the moral codes. Maybe that was cultural. So we don't want to do that. It also mentions that the uh, righteous will inherit a series of books which they will live their lives by and be judged by. And of course now we know what that is, that's the Bible. And it goes on to mention that the book of Enoch is not to be added to the canon. Even though, you know, if we believe the, en the book of Enoch as it is now, it has scripture, or quotes things that are in scripture, it has prophecy in it, but it's not to be added to the canon. It's to be se kept separate and given to those people in the last days who are entering or in that great tribulation period when everything is corrupted. So it's really amazing. That's in chapter 104. And it's, it's, depending on the translation you read, it, sometimes you miss it, you know, the old English type thing. Well, going on, there's a few others. There's some coming uh, prophecies when the Messiah comes. They don't say that they're first or second coming, just like in the Old Testament. You, you have to look and see if it's happened or not. But the Messiah was supposed to be born of a virgin. I thought that was amazing. Now, now I, can, I can understand why Isaiah says, you know what, I'll give you a sign. There will be a virgin that will conceive and bear a son, and you will call his name Emmanuel. And then he goes on talking about when he's 12 years old, certain things are going to happen, and that was fulfilled exactly. That's Isaiah mentioned here in Enoch. The Messiah will be denied by his own people. 
It doesn't say who those people are, you know, if they're Russians or whoever. Of course, Russians didn't even exist at that time. Whoever his people are, they deny him. Uh, it, then there will be this uh, section of books or this collection of books given to the righteous so they can be godly. It does say that the elect one will resurrect from the dead. So if we put all these things together, we've got this eternal son of God that somehow comes in human form, that somehow dies and resurrects, and his shed blood is what our salvation hangs on. It's really amazing. It's an amazing gospel. So much for the Muslim idea that Jesus didn't really die on a cross. It was someone else. Uh, and then at the end it says, man errors respecting the time and the calendar. You know, and there's this big debate today because we, we have the Messianic festivals and we know that certain things are going to happen on those festivals. But you look at the, the, what the Bible says, how you're supposed to calculate it. The modern Jewish calendar, and they're off slightly, a day or two sometimes, depending on what we're talking about. And of course, the calendar in general, everyone's trying to find the year 6,000. Some of the church fathers taught the second coming would be in the year 6,000, which kind of makes sense. Only I have no idea what year it is from creation. You know, I have an idea, and I've written a book on, on uh, creation history we'll be talking about this afternoon. But I could be off. So it's going to happen sometime, though. There's too, ma too many prophecies going on right now. End time prophecies, what we would call end time prophecies, things mentioned that haven't come to pass yet. Uh, okay, well, the first one kind of sort of has corrupted Bibles. Okay, so we have that collection of books given to the righteous that they'll be guided by. There will be people that will add books and change it and create their own versions. And we have at least 38 Bibles out there that are um, in English that are created directly by known cults. Not just the Jehovah's, Jehovah's Witness one and the Mormon one, but 38. So I thought that was interesting. And I'm not too sure about some of the others either, but that's my opinion. Uh, we know that Jude quoted Enoch, and that quote is that the Lord will come and judge uh, with 10,000 of his saints, and judge the ungodly against their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed against God. Uh, everyone will eventually kneel before the Messiah this incarnate word. I thought that was amazing. Philippians mentions that, which is actually a quote out of Isaiah. Everyone, every one of us here, everyone that's ever been, will resurrect. We, we find that in Daniel too. There's a re resurrection unto judgment, and resurrection unto eternal life. Um, the rapture is mentioned as the time when his righteous are being taken out of the midst. And I always wondered where that phrase came from, because Paul mentions that phrase exactly in 2 Thessalonians. But again, you always ask yourself, what comes out of the midst of what? Be a little more specific, because I'm not following you. So it's interesting. Some of the church fathers quote that phrase too, so you can begin to see how they interpreted the rapture. Valley of Dry Bones is mentioned. A prophecy that the years will be shortened. I thought that was interesting. If we used to have a 360-day year, now we have a 365-day year. We've got the prophecies in Revelation about the time changes. It's going to be kind of interesting. So the resurrection and the rapture are called a mystery. I thought that was interesting. Uh, again, the, the time of the resurrection and the shining or the changing, as mentioned. Paul mentions that too. I show you a mystery. It also mentions that this the group of people will be taken out and protected from the time of that great tribulation period. And the reason for that is given. I thought that was amazing. It's to cause repentance. If you're here now and you say, yeah, the pie in the sky stuff and the Bible stuff and the, yeah, don't mess with me. And half the population disappears overnight. And then you see the other prophecies, the Nile River being destroyed, these 10 nations aligning, stuff that you've been told about. That should make you think. You know, if I'm sitting here preaching and all of a sudden the room is empty, I mean, I should, that should click, you know. And so that, that's an amazing thing. It is for, because people always say, well, why would he take them out and allow other people? It's just one more mighty sign. Why did he destroy Egypt with the 10 plagues? It's a sign to all the other nations. The rapture happening is a sign to the earth. So it's amazing. 
And it's also called the mercy. Jude also mentions it as the mercy. Not just a mercy, but the mercy. So it's kind of interesting. There's a lot of other details in here, but going on just to look at a couple others. Truth would be altered in the latter days. We've got lots of cults and things now. Iran will attack Israel. Um, God sends confusion. And in the book of Enoch, it's interesting because it talks about these, these people, the Persians or the Iranians that from that area, they come and attack Israel and apparently nobody helps Israel. And Israel, even though they're good, that's an awful lot of people. And so God does what he's done so many times in the Old Testament we've seen. Armies come against Israel and God will say, you guys sit down and watch the show. I'll take care of this one. <laughs> and all of a sudden the enemies think that the other group of the enemy are Israel. And the enemies just attack each other and destroy each other. <laughs> Remember the time in the Old Testament when he said, leave your weapons at home and bring large sacks. <laughs> Set down and watch. And then he had the armies kill each other. And then when it was all done, the prophet said, okay, now the Lord says, you know those sacks you were brought? Go get the loot and go home. Isn't it amazing? It's good to know prophecy, but it's also good not to be alarmed because Israel will take care of itself when it can, and when it can't, God will take care of it. Uh, so anyway, going on, days would be shortened. The moon would change its order. That's kind of interesting. There will be blood up to a horse's bridle somewhere, sometime at some horrible battle mentioned in Enoch. Millennium, mortals and immortals will dwell together. It talks about the, this type of thing. And so again, we see that in Isaiah and other places. And there would be 7,000 years of history which we'll get to in a second. So these are just some of the things that are interesting. Again, it fits our Bible, and either it was copied from our Bible, or it's the same stuff that our Bible has. And so going on, I want to look at the most important prophecies, and we'll give a little bit of uh, detail to them. There's several, there's three particular prophecies I want to bring your attention to. There's a 70 generations prophecy, an apocalypse of weeks prophecy, and then a 70 shepherds prophecy. And this is pretty amazing. First off, the 70 uh, generations prophecy is found in Enoch chapter 10. And it mentions that the Messiah would come and fix things. And he would fix things, things would be fixed in the 70th generation. And I think that's interesting because when you go to Luke chapter 3, verses 23 to 38, you can start with Enoch, who should have been the guy writing this book and start and go with his son and his grandson and just count them down. And you'll find that from Enoch forward, there's been 70 generations. And the 70th generation was Jesus Christ. And he fixed things. I thought that was amazing. Apparently, everything is not completely fixed yet, but he started the process. And I'm thinking this might be a double fulfillment prophecy, so there may be other things connected with it too. And there are... Uh, if, you, if you study prophecy, there are um, prophecies that have two or three different meanings. But that was amazing to me. Again, the word. The apocalypse of week is found in chapters 91 through 93. And it's interesting. Most of you are probably familiar with Daniel's 70-week prophecy, where a week is a year. And you look at the calculations. On Sunday, we'll be looking at... Uh, the time the Messiah died in 32 AD and 1948 and 1967, and we're going to see some timeline prophecies. And this is kind of like this, like Daniel's 70s week prophecy, except he's got 7,000 years of human history broken up into 10 weeks, which I had to stop and wrap my head around that one. So in other words, a week is, is um, 700 years, which kind of makes sense, 100 years for a day, allegory. So you've got 10 weeks, one day to 100 years. Um, I came up with a date of creation uh, based on the Seder and Jasher and other things in Genesis as to be about 3925 BC. And we'll talk about that this afternoon. Um, but based on that, you could put 7,000 years and 7,000 years would end. Uh, and according to this prophecy, uh, the last 1,000 years are the Messiah's kingdom where everything is great. At the end of which there's this tremendous battle with Gog and Magog, and there's this destruction and this judgment. We 
which I would consider to be the great white throne judgment. So it's interesting if you come back from that hundred years and you go back a thousand years, the second coming should be in that day, which is sometime between 1975 and, and 2075. Now, I don't try to set a date for the second coming or the rapture because I don't want everybody to hate me. <laughs> um, there are dates, though, prophesied in Scripture where they've come to pass to the day, several in our lifetime. You remember in Exodus chapter 12, it said that the Exodus happened to the day that Abraham... Don't get confused and go early. You get slaughtered. Follow directions and know the prophecies correctly. So if we look at that, the great white throne judgment is, is there. And again, the second coming should be somewhere in that 100-year time period. I thought it's interesting because this is 2013. We're halfway there. And, you know, to people watching and skeptics understand, I'm not a nut. I'm just curious. Here's an ancient document at least 2,000 years old, if not older, that's making things like this. And it's for our time period. I thought that was amazing. Maybe it'll come to pass. Maybe it won't. But the fact that there is a document that says these things is not, can't be denied. Going on, there's these two dreams in the book of Enoch. And much like when you get to Revelation and you get all the strange symbols, it's because it's a dream or a vision. Again, there's symbols in this. The first dream is about the flood. And he sees a, a, basically a, a kind of a, a dish or a, a boat type thing with animals in it and water pouring out, and a destruction happens, but things kind of get okay afterwards. And so it's amazing. It's a prophecy of the flood. The second dream, though, kind of starts over, and everything's in the concept of sheep. And there's these sheep that are black or red or white. And if you read it and you think about it and you compare it to the Bible, it becomes pretty obvious. He's talking about Adam and then Eve and Cain and Abel, Seth. It mentions the Nephilim. Not much in detail, but in symbolism, it was a major event in that time period of history. Uh, Enoch, the Nephilim Civil War, the Flood, Abraham, Joseph, Moses, Exodus, Judges, that time period, Saul, David, Solomon, the building of a mighty temple, you know, these kind of things happen. And then Elijah, a great prophet to rise up, likened to himself. I thought that was interesting. So Enoch and Elijah are two super prophets, so to speak. Kind of makes me think of another Bible verse. But then it goes into this thing of 70 shepherds. Now, remember I told you that the church fathers said that there's a lot of corruption, a lot of cults, and a lot of times they identify like the Gospel of Judas. They'll tell you exactly which Gnostic cult wrote it and why. And they'll identify these things for you. Uh, in this case, the 70 shepherds, there is, I think it's 30 knock that mentions 70 angels coming down to do destruction and all. And if you put those together, it doesn't seem logical. But again, remember the church fathers said those were put out by cults, so we'll ignore those. And look at this as being a possible something. So the 70 shepherds actually turns out to be a prophecy of the rulers of Israel. And this is really amazing. I want you to, to focus on this one thing specifically. It says that the 70 shepherds or guardians of Israel, of the sheep, are going to be divided in three pieces. There's going to be 35, 23, and 12. Now, it gets a little easier because those 12 rule, I don't know if they're together or separate or whatever, during that time of tribulation. Okay, yay, so they're kind of out of the picture for what I'm interested in. Looking at the 35, it is kind of interesting. Uh, it starts, it goes all the way down to Solomon, which that's obvious looking at the text. And then it talks about there's going to be these 35 kings or shepherds and 12 hours. Again, it's not really weird like a Gnostic thing, but it, there's enough different numbers in it that you begin to get the feel that there's something here. What would these 12 hours be? But basically where the shepherds nap or breaks in rule. So what's interesting is, if you go back and you look at this, starting from after Solomon, there's Rehoboam, looking at the Jewish side where the temple was. Rehoboam to Zedekiah would be shepherds 1 through 20. Then there's these Gentile powers or gaps. There's 11 of those, and we'll look at those in a little bit. Babylon, Persia, and the nine Seleucid and Potomac empires. And those are mentioned in great detail in Daniel 11. Most people don't realize Daniel 11 starts in 536 B.C. and goes all the way up to 1948. 
just amazing looking at the very specifically too. He even mentions Cleopatra and things. But then we have these Maccabees that rule, sole rule of Israel, so that's shepherds 21 through 34, so we're missing one. You remember they end when Rome comes in, Pompey rides his horse in and declares this now to be Roman territory. And that stays that way until Bar Kokhba actually rebels and creates a very small Jewish state independent and keeps it independent for three years. I thought that was amazing. Then it was crushed and according to the prophecies of Micah, Israel was dispersed. But that gives us all of those. So that gives us 20, 11, one more, and one more. So it's amazing to see this. Just to let you understand the Gentile powers here. Here are the ones as mentioned. So Nebuchadnezzar takes the Jews into Babylon. He's t taken over, destroyed by Cyrus, the Persian Empire. And even though Cyrus was good, he still ruled. He didn't allow them to rule autonomously. So after him came Alexander the Great. He died quickly. His kingdom was split up, and we see this in Daniel 11. Ptolemy I from Egypt rules, and then Israel is taken over by Antiochus II from the Seleucid Empire, and then Ptolemy from Egypt, and they keep getting passed back and forth. They're owned by Syria, Egypt, Syria, Egypt. And each one of those can be verified by just looking them up. Finally, Antiochus Epiphanes. The Maccabees rebel, Antiochus dies, and they have sole rule for a while until Caesar comes in under Pompey and takes over. So again, it's amazing that Enoch would prophesy these 35 shepherds, and it works out perfectly. These 12 gaps, and according to Daniel, it works out perfectly. I'm glad we have the book of Daniel. The 70 shepherds. Uh, going on from there. So we have these 35. We know the 12 are during the tribulation period. So we have 23 left. Now this is interesting. It actually says that the, the uh, 12 rule during that time period. But it says in the text that the 23 are to rule in 58 circles. And you think, what does that mean? 58 circles or times or something like that. 58 something in 23. Again, it's not weird, but it's just different enough that you, there's something to it. You have that feel to it. And it dawned on me then, now if, if it ends in Bar Kokhba, according to the prophecies, Israel comes back the second time, as mentioned in Isaiah 12, and that was in 1948. So starting in 1948, we don't have kings that rule until they die. We have people that are elected that rule, and then they retire, and some of them, come back for re-election, either immediately or later on. Isn't this Netanyahu's like third time now? Something like that. So apparently there's going to be 23 separate men, men and or women, that rule, rulers in Israel, but they get re-elected to a point that there is actually 58 terms or 58 different types of government, something like that. So as of the date, we've had 13 men rule Israel in 21 terms, and there's been 32 different coalition governments that have been put together. So we're somewhere in the middle. This is amazing to me because in the prophecies of Micah chapter 5, it talks about the baby born in Bethlehem, and then the Jews give him up, and the reaction is that they're destroyed and dispersed until the time when she comes back, which is 1948. And then from when she comes back to the time that the Messiah sets up his kingdom, or that baby born in Bethlehem sets up his kingdom, there's going to be eight wars between Israel and Syria involving Israel taking Syrian land. Looking at that, we've had four of those. So it's amazing to me to see this is about halfway there. The Micah prophecy is about halfway there. Now with that, let me stop and say that I'm a pre-tribulational rapturist. And the church fathers taught that you compartmentalize prophecies. Some deal with the church, some deal with Israel, Sometimes they correlate, most of the time they don't. So the rapture could be at any time. It could be before we leave tonight. But that doesn't mean that the prophecies will not be fulfilled exactly as prophesied for Israel. Believing Jews, believing Gentiles will leave. Non-believing Jews, non-believing Gentiles will stay. And that rapture should spark repentance. So it's pretty amazing. 
Okay, that's the major things of the prophecies that I wanted to give to you, just to kind of as an overflow. And uh, with the time left, I wanted to touch just a little bit on the, the Nephilim history. And we have just a little bit of time left. But the Nephilim history, which most of us, you probably know, and we've talked about a lot out here, starts with Genesis 6. We have the, the Genesis 6 account of, at a certain point in the pre-flood world, that the sons of God came to the daughters of men and had children by them. And these children were men of renown, men of old. Uh, not necessarily tall, but powerful somehow. Giants in power, in stature, maybe both. And the flood was des destroyed this entire group. All flesh corrupted itself, it says. Now, the book of Enoch is interesting because it gives us the best, most details of this time period. A few extra details from the book of Jubilees and the events are mentioned by Josephus and a few other ancient writings. Uh, but basically, it tells the story of these sons of the angels that corrupted things. They begin to study things. They begin to do genetic experiments. They begin to corrupt all forms of life. And it's interesting because you look at that and you think, and when I first read this, it was back in when I was in high school. And then when I went to seminary, one of my professors taught on a lot of these other books simply because they were favorite books of the church fathers. I was blessed to have a, a really, couple of really good professors. But what's interesting about this is, I, I would look at that and think it sounds like Star Trek, Star Wars type stuff, and it's just a little too incredible. But now I go to even staying off the internet. Uh, if you just watch programs on National Geographic, I'm sure you've all seen the glowing mice, the glowing dogs and cats, and the uh, cows that give human DNA, um, um, they have DNA to produce um, antibodies. We have uh, my, uh, sheep and, and pigs with uh, human hearts and human livers. And again, it's all supposedly for people that need those parts and they won't reject them and these type of things. But again, that's what I suppose good medical science is doing. But you know whatever is developed, military people take it. And even if you say, well, the United States wouldn't do that. <laughs> let, let me digress. <laughs> even if the United States would not do that, China and Russia and other places have already said they will. So even if you're probably not going to and wouldn't, the whole idea that your enemy might come up with something to wipe you out means you're going to too anyway. Okay, and so it eventually gets that way. I don't know if we're that way yet, but if they're telling us all these things they're doing, and like in Britain last couple of years with all the human-animal hybrids, they were allowed to experiment with them as long as they destroyed the fetuses by like 14 weeks or something. So it's theoretically, they're not around. But again, if they're telling us these things, what are the experiments they're doing where they're not telling us? So... Again, it's, the, it's what the prophecies talked about, these type of things. But what was amazing to me was, I'm thinking now, genetic experiments, uh, how would we do it? We use computers, we use test tubes, we map the DNA. They didn't have any of that stuff from beforehand. But Jubilees adds some interesting things to it. It talks about they were destroyed, and Canaan, after the flood, found certain records about the watchers and decided to keep quiet about it and try to use it. And of course, then all of a sudden we have giants in the land of Canaan. Really interesting. So if you have a, a directional map and follow directions. What I thought was interesting is in, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we only have pieces of Enoch, but we also have a fragment that's called the Book of Giants. I think it's part of the Enoch literature, uh, but it may not be, but it gives you the same basic information. One of the things that it mentions and I thought that was really interesting, was it mentions how the angels started doing some of the genetic tampering. Not, not a whole lot, but just enough to give you the idea behind it. And you all know that you, you can mix different kinds of cats and different kinds of dogs, but when you try to mix a cat and a dog, it just doesn't work. There's something in the DNA that prevents it. And what this text says, and I, I have it in the back of the book because I, I think it's important and goes along with it, what, what the text actually says was they took, and as an example, they took 200 horses and 200 donkeys 
and put them together. Well, we know that makes mules. And most of us think that mules are incapable of reproducing, and that's true most of the time. But in this last century, there's been uh, at least 20-some mules that have been known to reproduce. I don't know if their, theirs can reproduce or not, but it is possible sometimes. And normally this happens, I understand, in a lot of places, sheep and goats mate. And you get like a half sheep, half goat, and some people do that for the meat in certain areas. And so, but it actually described sheep and goats, horses, donkeys, and then other types of forms. But what they did was they would do this in sets of 200, like 200 sheep, 200 goats, made them together. You should get basically 200 of whatever. And I thought that was interesting because a lot of them probably couldn't reproduce, but some of them could. And I, I got to researching this, and when you look at, and I forget the exact numbers, but horses have so many chromosomes and donkeys have so many chromosomes and you put them together and the mule's kind of in between. It's an unstable life form. Same with whatever the, I don't know if it's called a jeep or what, but the, the half sheep with a G. I think I've actually seen that. But the half sheep, half goat, the same thing. The chromosome count is in the middle somewhere. And so it's interesting to me, you get something that's unstable, it's half this, half that, that could reproduce, something else that's half this, half that, that could reproduce. Then you put these two together. You know, and if you have enough of those you put together, some of them will reproduce. And so that's basically the old-fashioned, easy way, if you have tons and tons of animals, of manipulating them. And that's what this, this text says they did. And I just thought that was amazing. No computers needed, no mapping of DNA. Of course, if it started with the angels, the angels would probably be able to look at you and see exactly what your chromosome count is and know that that won't, but those will. You know, I would imagine. But it's an amazing thing. So Genesis 6, Enoch, chapters 6 through 16 about the fallen angels, Book of Jubilees, Book of Giants, gives us a, a great detail on the Nephilim history, the pre-flood. Jubilees goes on and talks about how um, after the flood, Canaan put these together and we've got this man-made type giants, still apparently very, very good because I know that when a human being gets giantism, when they get like seven, eight, or close to nine feet tall, they're not great warriors. They fall over, they break things. They're just not they're, they're really tall and maybe big, but they just don't have it. Very, very dangerous for a human to be that big. And so, but apparently the giants in Canaan weren't that problem. We remember Goliath, which apparently was, uh, I think, like one quarter giant, three quarter Philistine. He was only nine feet tall. Uh, only. <laughs> yeah, some of these giants, post-flood giants are, and I thought this is interesting. There's some found in, in the Philippines and in Americas and some found in, uh, in China. And much like you have really tall humans in Russia, us in the middle, and Chinese are kind of short in general. Same thing with the, the giants. I thought the South, South uh, China giant was only like about 10 feet tall. You know, and you've got others that are 13 feet seems to be average. Some of them like Og get close to 18 feet. We have that in scripture, so. It's interesting to see how climates do change things. So, but it goes on and talks about the things that they did and, the, and then eventually we have David wiping out the last of the giants and, and Goliath and his family uh, to where they're gone. And they're talked about by Josephus and lots of other things. So these things are coming back. It's spooky to think that we're beginning to manipulate things. And the first thing that I think of is you mix species together and something gets out and it probably would die on its own, but what kind of bacteria or something would be released? What kind of epidemic would happen? You know, and so not to mention, you know, possible other creatures. Although we have some very strange things in the book of Revelation that could be symbolic, like a lot of things are, or perhaps very literal. So... Very interesting. We all know during the tribulation period, just looking at the book of Revelation, we have a quarter of the population being destroyed and then a third, which would be another quarter. So just between the, the bowls and the, and the trumpets, we have half of the earth's population, which would be about three and a half, four million, something like that, dying. Or billion, excuse me. Yes. Billion, million, my mind can't go that high. But it's, it's amazing to think of these type of things. 
So just going on, these are some books that we produced. And again, I, I want to follow the church fathers and their teachings. Any books that they liked or didn't like, I want to make people aware of. So Enoch is one. Uh, Fallen Angels is about the fallen angels and all that stuff from all the different books. Uh, ancient paganism. I found records uh, from the rabbis that actually told us what the pre-flood pagan religion was. Uh, at least 10 points to it. And that's able to help us understand the Canaanite religions and, and those type of things. And again, remember the scripture says that that kind of sorcery comes back. You know, and it was important for me to know what in the world is sorcery. Is it Mickey Mouse with a hat? You know, that's what I kind of think about. Uh, hopefully it's not eating a hamburger because I'd be in trouble. But if I don't know what it is, I don't know if I'm doing it or not. I remember in high school thinking, hearing about the genetic stuff, and I thought, why don't we try to clone a mouse? You know, and, and my, my biology professor said, uh, no, you're talking about tens of thousands of dollars worth of machines, and you probably wouldn't be able to do it anyway. But I remember thinking, that sounds interesting. And then I read the book of Jasher and realized how angry God got. That's his. He has a patent on it, so to speak. Don't mess with it. He won't sue you. He will kill you. You know, and that's the way it should be. But Jubilees tells the story. Jubilees and Enoch, of course, are Dead Sea Scrolls, also found other places. Ancient Church Fathers tells you all the, the doctrines that the Church Fathers taught and kind of putting those things together. Um, ancient Post Flood History we'll be talking about this afternoon. Again, what it does is I went through Jasher, some of these old documents filling in the blanks of what Genesis account gives us. And so we can figure out from creation to the flood, from the flood to the exodus, you know the exact number of years. You know from the Bible and these other places the exact year when Abraham was in Egypt, when Joseph was in Egypt, when Moses was in Egypt. So taking those, going back to Egyptian documents, it, you actually find evidence of things. And so it's kind of amazing. And we did that for, um, I think, 23 different nations to see where the kids of Noah went. And it helps with prophecy. I've had people say, well, you know, the Gog Magog invasion. People say it's Russia. Most scholars now think it's some people in Turkey, you know, because of this, or they think it's something else because there's no evidence. And I keep thinking, you've never read Jasher. I mean, it mentions Magog's great-grandson as being the first Scythian king, and it mentions the first three kings and that they settled right north of that mountain range. There's no other way it can be anything other than a Russian invasion. You know, this, you can't argue those things. But Satan will come out with all sorts of weird ideas in the end. This is really that. That's really this. Nobody really knows. The ancient documents are really specific. So, and ancient prophecies reveal we put together 500 prophecies in order of fulfillment. Like I say, there's been 50 since Israel's come back. Uh, again, talking about those ancient names, it says that Tarshish would be the first to bring the, the Jews back during the second return. And Tarshish is one of the ancient names for Britain. And I thought it was interesting how we did have a British mandate and the British were the first ones to start that process. Balfour Declaration, divide the country, and then things got corrupted. So these are some things for further study. But basically, I just want to introduce this to you and understand again, the Bible is based out of 66 books. It proves itself by prophecy. It says that it's complete. Books like this say, do not add me to that section of books. It has actual prophecy in it. That shouldn't be confusing because in the first century, we know we've had uh, church fathers that have the gifts of uh, words of wisdom, words of knowledge. You know, the Lord may tell you to go do something and it might help somebody's life. You might write a book about your experience, but don't put it in the canon, even though it was an actual God intervention. You know, the canon is the canon, but these other things are that way. And again, there are parts of Enoch and parts of these other books that are corrupted, and if you know the New Testament very, very well, it's obvious. But don't throw the whole baby out with the bathwater, because it can be important. At that point, we'll go ahead and close, because I think our time is getting close. But thank you for having me. I encourage you to study the scriptures, stick with the 66, study them on a daily basis, and then look at some of these others and look at current events and see what happens. Thank you and God bless. <laughs>